Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone today. Welcome to Northside United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Tony Harder. It's good to be here today on a cold, rainy Sunday morning, but it's good to have everyone here. We will uh, we'll start our worship, uh, well, we'll start our service with a little bit of a, a couple of announcements here. Um, first of all, we sent an email out if you'd like to join us for breakfast. Our uh, breakfast bunch will be meeting at we- this Wednesday at 9 o'clock. Um, Denny's on Wade Hampton, did I say that right? So, 9 o'clock. We would like, if you would, to call the office or... There's a sign-up sheet out in the narthex, or let me or Lorraine know, so we kind of reserve the the proper size table, let them know we're coming. Um, Also, Jerry wanted to have a short meeting after the service for the visitation committee, so if you're on that that team, uh, hang around a little bit after worship today. We're going to do that here. Where are you going to meet, Jerry? In the parlor. In the parlor, okay. Uh, Bill? Fabian wanted me to announce that uh, the yellow mission envelopes are uh, in the pews today so that you can help support the backpack ministry with your uh, donation. So uh, please uh, be aware of that. Um, We are collecting personal care items for Serenity Place. He's got a box out in the narthex there. There's a list of items uh, of what uh, that that are needed uh, on the table there by the tub. So please, uh, please consider that. And then uh, we want to encourage everyone to uh, go to the, uh, the UMCOR. Uh, UMCOR is the, the uh, organization within the Methodist Church that, that, uh, that goes and helps uh, people when there have been natural disasters and, and things of that nature. And the UMCOR Global Ministries website now, you can go and see how they're uh, uh, providing relief and assistance to the people of Turkey and Syria after this uh, devastating earthquake that they've experienced. Mm-hmm. And uh, possibly, uh, you know, there's probably a way there that you can help. It will show you how you can help in that effort. So we encourage everyone to, uh, to check that out. Any other uh, announcements that we need to speak of today? All right. <clears throat> well, let's put our hearts in a spirit of worship as we've come together Seeking Jesus and uh, seeking to join together as his people in fellowship uh, to worship him today. Our call to worship is, uh, is, in the, um, is in the bulletin. Are you awake? Are you alert? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Are you watching the signs? Are you interpreting what is happening today? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Do you see opportunities for ministry? Do you see the poor, the homeless, the hungry, the needy? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Come, let us worship and let us work in the reign of God. Christ has extended the invitation. Let us work together in the reign of God on earth. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, do we sense your presence this morning? We know that you never abandon us, you never leave us. And as we have joined together today in this place, in this sanctuary, we seek to know that you are here with us. Lord, we open our hearts to you. We open our minds to your word. We, the people of of Christ, come to you now. We lift up his name in worship. Amen. Good morning. We are going to sing a hymn that's in one of my other hymn books that was laid on my heart just a couple weeks ago. So I thought we'd just put the lyrics on the screen and then your bulletin. Um, The choir's going to stand and we're going to sing at one time. And then I'll ask you to join and follow along with us. We'll do it a couple weeks so you can learn it. But I think you'll you'll really love the, the words of this hymn, Grace.
all stand and join us with the lyrics that are on the screen or within your bulletin. Lord, as I see. again next Sunday, so you'll have another chance to learn that a little bit better, but great job. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everyone. While we're standing, let us, uh, let us recite the Apostles' Creed as found on page 881 of our hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, for I have commanded you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commandments, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient and you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to our offertory at this time. So I would ask the, uh, ask the ushers to please come forward for our morning offering.
Almighty God, you have shown us how we should live our lives. You, out of your generosity, Father, have displayed to us that love should be at the forefront of all we do. Lord, now this offering is an expression of our love for you and for your church, and we bring it with hearts of love and ask you to use it, Father, as you would, so that your kingdom would grow. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our love, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. It's our prayer time. So I would ask if, uh, if you have folks that we need to pray for this morning. Get to the right page in my book. Anyone? Uh, yes, Dottie. Oh, hold on just a second, okay? Yep, that's okay. Yeah, Dottie. Okay. So the Kilbride family, okay. Okay, what were you saying? Hold on, I'm sorry. Yeah, we had a student from uh, Summit Drive uh, Elementary that was, uh, that was injured and hurt their eye, and uh, we want to be in, in uh prayer for, for them that, uh, that, uh, that her eye would uh, heal completely. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes? That's your daughter-in-law, Janine. Has second, uh, I'm sorry, long-term COVID, and you said, Long COVID, right. Okay, so be in prayer. Okay, so this is the second time she's had it, so we'll be in prayer for Janine. Um, Katie's, or Jonathan's uh, grandfather, James Bird, is, uh, has, has had uh, health problems for some time, and uh, they're, they're talking of uh, possibly hospice at this point, so... We'd like to lift up James uh, Bird and Jonathan and Jonathan's mom, uh, Gloria, and uh, as, as they go through a difficult time here uh, with that, that whole family. Yes, Kevin. Yeah, we, will, we would definitely want to lift up the folks in Turkey and Syria. That's just such a great tragedy. Uh, I had heard 28,000 people killed so far, and they're still, you know, recovery is still underway. So, terrible tragedy, and we would lift those, those people up as well. Tony. Yeah. Laura, um, our daughter, Laura, had uh, some... Uh, uh, surgery on her gums and that's been pretty painful and you know pretty difficult for her and she's she's still getting over her situation with her foot so we'd like to lift up Laura for healing today that uh, that she gets gets on a path to wellness real soon Tony. yes Lorraine our daughter Beth uh, just traveling safety she's uh, flying to Seattle Wednesday on her way to Hawaii okay so, all right, so safe travels for uh, Beth, yeah, and Lorraine, and, and Owen's family. daughter as she travels. Yeah, and her family. And, what's that? And her family. She's and her family. She's okay, yeah. Son. Okay. And, fa- and family. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? All right. Well, we turn now to God with our prayers today.
great God in heaven. Lord, what a wonder it is that in spite of your sovereignty, your divinity, your uh, holiness, and your place in heaven, your place above all things, Father, uh, in spite of all of those uh, glorious elements of who you are, you are still very near to us. You are always with us. You take care of us. And Father, we seek your presence. We seek um, to live a, a more complete life through, through your presence and through your holiness. Lord, as we consider your presence, we also consider that you have shown us and given us all that we need for life. You have shown us through your word, uh, the Holy Scripture, that there is a law, there is a way of living that pleases you, that makes us complete, that gives us satisfaction. Lord, let us understand that law in your way. And where there's confusion, Father, you have sent Jesus, and you have sent the Holy Spirit and whatever confusion we might have had about the law, Lord Jesus brought clarity to that. He, he focuses, focuses us on your desires for our life. And he asks us to be changed. That in order to fulfill that law would require something that's not inside of us. And so you sent Jesus. You sent the one that has saved us, the one that went to the cross and took away all of our iniquities. He took away what is within each of us that keeps us away from you. We're so grateful that we can have faith in Christ and through his great work and your great love, we can experience a kind of grace that seems unattainable in our own lives in any other way. But Lord, let us be challenged by the words of Jesus, by what he taught, what he lived, what he did to live differently. Let us live in his way. Let us live not just to fulfill the law, but to understand the spirit in which the law was given. To fill us with your love and to allow us to love you and to love one another. We seek you today, Father. We seek a better way through Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up those that have been on our prayer list for healing. And today we have brought others to you. We pray for the Kilbride family. We pray, Lord, for this student from Summit Drive Elementary that's undergoing these surgeries to, to heal her eye. Please, Lord, bring full and complete healing to this child. Lord, we pray for Janine that she would um, be made well. Father, we pray for James Bird and his family as they uh, are in a very difficult time. Lord, give him comfort. Give him relief from pain and weakness. And let them all find the presence of Christ in their lives in these days. Father, we think of those who have undergone, su uh, suffered under this great tragedy of this earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Father, bless these with recovery and relief. And Lord, let your people, the people of Christ, help all of those in need in these, uh, in these countries today. Father, we pray that Laura would be healed. And Lord, we pray that Beth and her family would have safe travel. And that others in our uh, congregation that might be traveling would be safe as well. Father, we are so grateful to be here this morning to join together as your family, as your children, 
to gather around your altar and to lift up our hearts to you. We pray these things, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we join together now and pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Need a little water after that. Jessica's doing the same thing. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, we uh, hopefully are seeking your word every day in every part of our lives. Now, during this part of our worship, Father, we do seek it. We want to hear it and understand it. Lord, we pray that you would give us ears that are understanding of it, and a mind, and a heart, and a spirit 
that would learn from it. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, so I, I don't know why I feel a little bit out of sorts today. I don't, maybe it's the rain, the whatever, but uh, I just have to kind of be honest with you. And I'm a little bit out of sorts, but we'll, we'll get going and uh, see what God brings us through His Word today. Um, I used to have a, a friend, uh, and I only have, don't, uh, he's still my friend, but he's, he's retired now. Uh, and I knew him at, at work, but he retired before I did. And uh, he, he enjoyed coming to the office, and, uh, and we might have a political discussion, or, you know, there's plenty of politics for us to discuss at the office, rather than do the work that we're supposed to be doing at the office. So, anyway, he would come by, and uh, he was always, he, one of his favorite, favorite expressions, we'd be talking about something particularly controversial, and he'd stop, and he'd kind of tilt his head, and he'd say, what's the Bible say about that? And... Uh, I guess it was his way of reminding us that it's a fallen world. But uh, this story that uh, we're reading today in Scripture uh, of our sermon is uh, uh, put me in mind of that. Um, we're, we're learning of Jesus' sermon on the mount today. We'll be, I'm preaching from part of that sermon. And uh, Jesus quotes sermon. Jesus uses, I'm sorry, Scripture and uses Scripture and then he goes a little bit further. And so um, I was thinking of what, what that friend of mine used to say. We ask ourselves many times probably, if we're faithful to Christ, what does the Bible say about that? Jesus gives us some illumination on that and how we're to live. So it's uh, uh, Matthew 5, verse 21 through 37 is uh, our scripture to that today. So uh, let's read that now. As we continue in worship, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Jesus goes on. He says, you have heard it was said... You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of ancient to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That's kind of, there's a lot of difficult teaching in there. Jessica's nodding. There's a lot of difficult teaching in there. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the difficulties of it. In this story from Matthew 5, we, uh, we see that um, if we go back just a little bit, Jesus has come out of the wilderness 
Jesus has become his, uh, started his preaching ministry, his teaching ministry, really. Up until this time, Jesus has been doing many things, but, but he hasn't been teaching so much as, uh, as we're used to. And at one point, after in Matthew chapter 4, it says, From this time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus is about to teach what the kingdom of heaven is, what it means, and that we should change and that we have to change to live in that kingdom, to fully appreciate that kingdom. He has called for his first four apostles. He has called Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. He has called James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they are with him. And they have traveled around the Sea of Galilee, in the region around the Sea of Galilee. And Scripture says that in, that travel, in those travels, he has been preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. The word of Jesus has spread all around that region. It says, in fact, it says throughout the region of Syria, and how ironic it is that we talk of Syria and Turkey today, and this is the very region where people had heard of Jesus in these days and were coming to hear his message. People were, br were bringing their friends and family that were diseased, that were suffering pain, that were demon-possessed, people that were having seizure, seizures and that were paralyzed, and he heals every one of them. Whoever came to Jesus, he healed. Large crowds were, were forming around Jesus and following him. Crowds from Galilee, uh, crowds, crowds from a region called the Decapolis, which was an area of ten cities, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and the region from across the Jordan River. So people were coming from far and wide to hear from Jesus. It's within that context that Jesus really begins his teaching ministry. And he begins it with what we call the Sermon on the Mount and that Matthew uh, records in his Gospel and is recorded in other Gospels as well. In this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes. And then he teaches about 18 different topics that to him were representative and important for the people of that area and that time to hear. Today, we're going to consider his teaching on the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth of those topics. He talks about anger. He talks about adultery or lust. He talks about divorce. And he talks about making vows. In each case, Jesus begins his teaching on that topic by saying, You have heard it said. And then he follows it up and says, But I tell you. I suppose if uh, in our modern day, for some of us, Jesus was giving what many of us might consider to be a, a kind of a TED talk about how to live. But in every case, Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And Jesus is explaining that as strict as the law seems to be, if you want to follow me, as incredible as it may sound, that you need to go beyond what the law says. His message seems to be that living in God's kingdom might not really be that easy. It's a message that Jesus repeats often, this message that says, following me is not necessarily an easy task. We think of other stories in Scripture, such as the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what do I have to do to follow you? And Jesus, Jesus says, follow the commandments, to which the young man says, yes, I do that. And then Jesus says, well, you need to sell everything you have and follow me. That's a difficult thing. So we have that story. Jesus tells his followers at one point that if you want to follow me, know that you will have no place to lay your head. That we will travel around and we will not have a home. We will not have a place to lay our heads at night. He also says at one point to someone who was considering following him, who said, well, let me go back. I've got affairs to take care of, business to take care of. And Jesus says, no, if you, need, if you want to follow me, you need to just leave those things behind. He says, don't even take time to bury your father. And Jesus 
in another story, in fact, many other stories, told his, his followers that they would be persecuted as well. So Jesus has told us often that to follow him might be a difficult path to take. When Jesus says in these passages, but I tell you, he, wasn't, he was beginning to try to explain what it means to live by the law that God has given them hundreds of years before. He isn't doing away with the law to give his own beliefs, but he was giving us a further understanding of why God made the law in the first place. So he has these four topics murder and anger, lust and adultery, divorce, and this idea of giving oaths. Let's talk about murder and anger first, and I'll probably spend more time on this one than any of them, but we'll talk about that, because that's the first thing he talked about in this passage. You know, Moses said, and this is why Jesus said in ancient times it was said, you heard it said, Moses said, you shall not murder. But Jesus is saying you shouldn't even become angry enough to murder for when we're angry enough to do that, we've committed murder in our hearts. The Pharisees, when they read this law, even though they hadn't literally murdered anyone, they felt righteous at that point. And yet the Pharisees were angry enough in that moment to soon begin plotting to have Jesus killed. No doubt killing is a great sin, but anger is a great sin as well because it violates God's command to love. When we're angry, that anger pushes love out of our hearts. And anger is a dangerous emotion, is one of the things I think Jesus is telling us here. Anger is dangerous because we never know when it will leap into the control of our lives perhaps causing violence, causing emotional hurt, and spiritual damage. Here's a story of an example of that. One day a pastor went to a yard sale, and he found a lawnmower. Seemed in good shape, and the owner said it worked, so the pastor ultimately decided to buy it. And it was pretty cheap, so he thought he got a pretty good deal. So after looking the machine over, the pastor filled it with gas, He took it home, looked it over, filled it with gas, and was ready to use it. Unfortunately, after a few tugs on the cord trying to get it to start, nothing happened. He spent 15, 20 minutes trying to get that mower to start. And if you've got a lawnmower, you know the frustration that that caused. He pulled it a few more times. He finally gave up. Fortunately, the yard sale was still going on. So he he went back angry by now, getting angrier by the minute, and asked for his money back. This machine doesn't work, the pastor said. Well, the man said, I did forget to tell you one thing about the lawnmower. He said, this lawnmower only works if you curse at it. Curse at it, the pastor said. Well, I can't do that. He said, I'm a man of truth. I don't even know if I can curse anymore. It's been so long since I've done it. That's when the the man smiled and looked at the pastor and said, Well, just keep pulling that rope, pastor. It'll come back to you. We never know where anger, anger will take us. We have to be very careful. Anger will cause us to say and do things we wouldn't normally say and do. Jesus is telling his followers that we're to exercise control over not just our actions, but our thoughts, because that's where anger starts, is in our mind. Jesus says anger gets in the way of our peace. When you have kept God's rules, when have you kept God's rules, but closed your eyes to His intent? And I'm going to add a little side note here, because one of the things that was very interesting to me about this passage, it says... uh, right off, let's see, verse 20, I'm sorry, my glasses are, are uh, causing me some trouble. Verse 22, he says, you, you fool, you could be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus actually uses that comment two or three times throughout this passage. 
He references hell. And I, I just want to put a little aside here. There are preachers in our day and age that will tell you that there is no hell, that God does not judge you, that God loves you, which is absolutely true, but that He loves everybody too much to ever have you condemned. But I point to this as one example. Jesus Himself references what happens when we separate ourselves from Him. And He doesn't deny the existence of hell. That's a harsh learning as well, but it's here in God's Word. In this same passage about anger, Jesus talks about your anger and disputes. And He says, don't put your anger and disputes ahead of God and He says, do what you can to resolve your differences with others. As I read that, I couldn't help but think that one of the things Jesus is saying for the church is don't bring your disputes into the church. And if you do have a dispute in the church, don't bring it to the altar. He says, if you've got a dispute before you come to my altar, you need to resolve it. And he gives a little bit of a warning here. He says, says, the other thing you need to know is you're not always right. Be careful to think that you're always right. He says, if you have a dispute, he says, you better try to resolve it before you go to the judge because you may not be the person that's right no matter how convicted you are. Have a humility about you. Have a kind of a meekness about you. Be more understanding of others and their viewpoints. That is a hard teaching as well. There was a story in Reader's Digest, though, that illustrates why we need to have that caution in our, life, in our lives. There was a traveler between flights at an airport. This is a story someone sent into Reader's Digest. She went to the lounge, and she bought a small package of cookies, it said, she said. Then she sat down, and she began reading her newspaper. Soon she became aware of a rustling noise, and from behind her paper, she peeked over the top and saw a neatly dressed man helping, herself, helping himself to her cookies. Not wanting to make a scene, she leaned over and took a cookie herself. A few minutes passed, and then more rustling. He was helping himself to another cookie. After a while, they came to the end of the package with one cookie left. By now, she was so angry that she didn't dare allow herself to say anything. Then, as if to add insult to injury, she said, the man took the very last cookie, broke it in two, and pushed half across to her. And he ate the other half, and he left. By now, she's just really fuming. And after a few minutes, her flight was announced, So she opened her handbag to get her ticket out, and to her shock and embarrassment, there she found her package of unopened cookies. We need to be careful when we think that we're the only one that can be right in a given situation. Jesus says our relationships with others reflect our relationship with God. 1 John 4 says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. If we carry a grievance against someone, we violate what Jesus says is the greatest commandment to love your neighbor. This reminds us that when we hold on to hate in our hearts, it impacts our lives. When we hold on to hate for others, it impacts our relationship with God. So that's what Jesus says about anger and about um, reconciling with those we have a disagreement with. He then goes on and talks about adultery. And this is probably famous to those of us that have been in the church that Jesus says, look, adultery is not just a physical act, but it's an act of the mind. And then to emphasize the point, he says, if your eye is causing you to sin, take it out. If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. Now, Jesus is speaking figuratively. That's well out of character for Scripture for Him to say that, to do those things in practice. But it emphasizes the damage that unrepentant sin causes in our lives if we leave it unchecked and unrecognized. It will destroy us. 
And Jesus said, again, there's a higher standard here. Moses said, don't commit adultery. But he says, if you've looked with some, at someone with lust, you've already committed adultery. You're already going down that path. He says something that's maybe a little similar about divorce next. He highlights the importance of that marriage bond and says that you have to be very careful about divorce. He says unless there's unfaithfulness involved that it shouldn't happen. Now, we know that on any of these topics we could preach for a long time and we can talk about what that really means practically in our lives. But know that what God is saying is that the marriage bond is a holy and sacred thing. It's not to be taken lightly. And I know when I talk about these things, there might be people that this seems hurtful to. Know that I'm just asking us to consider what Jesus himself is saying about these kinds of things. God sets a very high bar for dissolving a marriage. Another thing that this does is it el- this passage does is it elevates the value of women because in that day women were considered little more than property. But Jesus is saying women are very valuable. We need to treat them with respect and love and care. The last thing Jesus talks about is keeping oaths, not swearing, but rather saying yes or no. What Jesus is emphasizing here is the importance of telling the truth. People were breaking promises. Even, even the, the religious authorities were breaking promises and using sacred language ca- casually and care- carelessly. Keeping oaths and vows is important. It builds trust. But we shouldn't make those vows and oaths casually. Often we do it knowing that we don't intend to live up to it. Our society needs those things. I assume you still have to swear an oath when you go to court. Thank goodness I don't spend a lot of time in court. But this passage speaks to our character. Are you a person of your word? Truthfulness seems so rare in these times that we feel we must swear or promise that it is the truth. Jesus says, have the character so that when you say yes, people know you mean yes. Have the character so that when you say no, people know you mean no. What does all of this mean? Is there some way that we can put all of this together to tie it all together? And as I thought about that, what Jesus is telling us here, first of all, we have to go back just a little bit in, the, in our Bible to understand why Jesus brings this up. Because just before he preaches about this, he says, he says, don't think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but, abolish, but to fulfill. And then he gets into this teaching. And what Jesus seems to be saying is, here's the law. But don't live just good enough for the law. I've often heard it said that the law or a, or is a standard, Clay, you probably deal with this, a building standard that somebody says, you know, you have to build a building according to this standard. That standard is really the minimum level. It's like it can't be less than that. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't build it to a higher standard. But a standard, a law, is the lowest standard. You should live beyond it is what Jesus is saying. Don't just stop at the law. Look at the spirit behind the law. Why did God tell us not to, not to commit murder? Well, obviously because it's wrong to commit murder, but because it means we don't love people that we're, we're using violence to, to take care of our lives. For Jesus... For us to be righteous meant being in a right relationship with God. And that kind of relationship bears the fruit of right actions. When we live righteously, then others see that. Others come to Christ. Is it the wedding service that makes us honor, love, and cherish our spouse? I hope not. 
because we honor, cherish, and love that person, we get married. The wedding is a seal of that love. Jesus is telling us, if we love Him, if we love God, give more. Give more. Love more. I think it's difficult to take any one of these passages of Scripture and apply it in our lives. But Jesus says, at least consider what it means to go beyond. When you have anger, when you have lust in your mind, when you've got a broken relationship, and when you're faced with expressing the truth and living up to the truth, he says, I ask you to look beyond. Jesus challenges us. For us to live as Jesus is a challenge because it's not easy. But Jesus says, do the best you can and then do a little more. I know you'll fall, but when you fall, I'll pick you up. I'll hold you. I'll help you. And where we have sin, what a great gift that Jesus went to the cross, that Jesus died on the cross and He takes our sins away. Even when we don't live up to the, to, the, uh, to the ideal of the law, there is a better way. Jesus will fulfill that for us through His blood given on the cross, spilled on the cross. What a great gift of His grace to know that we can live beyond what we think we're capable of doing because of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Let us stand and turn in our hymnals to page 467, Trust and Obey, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. forget if you want to join us for breakfast Wednesday uh, sign up or call Lorraine let her know this week let us pray God as we go from this place let us understand 
that as we follow Jesus, Lord, there is a higher standard to our lives. Let us find that place and let us change our minds through the Holy Spirit's presence within us to live a different way, to trust you, to obey you, and to walk the path Jesus has laid before us. Amen.